Welcome, everybody, um, to our Aspen event on open strategic autonomy, the future of the EU's economic and trade policy. Um, today, we want to discuss what the concept of open strategic autonomy means, um, also from different uh, country perspectives. Um, and we also want to take a closer look at the future of EU um, trade policy. Um, in preparation of our event today, um, I took a look at the dictionary, um, checking what openness, uh, strategic and autonomy means. And let me briefly share this with you. Openness refers to accessibility of knowledge, technology and other resources, the transparency of action and the inclusiveness of participation. And surprise, surprise, it means the opposite of closeness. <laughs> strategic. Strategic means or relates to the identification of long-term or overall aims and interests and the means of achieving them. And autonomy means the ability to make your own decisions about what to do rather than being influenced or told by somebody else to do what he or she wants you to do. Um, I'm sure that the uh, concept of open strategic aut autonomy is much more than just the sum of these three components and three definitions. Um, and that is what we want to discuss today. And we have a really stellar panel to do so. Um, with us today is Dr. Sabine Weyand. She is Director General of the Directorate General for Trade um, from the European Commission. Hello, Sabine. Thank you for being here today. And we have Professor Thomas Philippon, Thomas, not Thomas, Thomas. <laughs> and um, he is Max Heine Professor of Finance uh, at the Stern School of Business in New York and a member of the French Council of Economic Advisors and a member of the uh, G7 panel of experts on resilience of the UK um, G7 presidency. Hello, Thomas. Good morning. And oh, that's right. It's morning for you. It's afternoon for us. Um, <laughs> um, a truly international panel uh, we are having. Um, Dr. Claudia Schmucker, um, she is head of geoeconomics um, at the uh, German Council on Foreign Relations, DGRP, and you are um, here from Berlin. Hello, Claudia. Um, and uh, Dr. Natalie Tocci, she is director of the Instituto Affari Internationali. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today and being here. Hello, Natalie. And last but not least, um, our very own um, Aspen Senior Fellow, Elmar Brook, um, former member of the European Parliament and chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Thank you so much, Elmar, for being here today. So how we want to do this, um, I would first like to ask each of our panelists um, a brief question. Um, then we want to engage um, in a little bit of a discussion um, among the panelists before we then open it up for discussion. Um, all of you in the audience, you can um, use the chat function um, to write your questions um, starting pretty much now. And then I would integrate them from the very, very start into the discussion, but we will also have a section um, later on where I open it up um, for your comments. Um, and I would call on you if you like to, uh, if, if you would like but to participate and you can ask your questions um, directly uh, to the audience. Um, so just that you get an idea of the timing, um, we will spend until I would say about 3.45 um, among the panel and then opening up um, for um, an exchange with the, with the audience. So Sabine, um, the concept of open strategic autonomy is something new and maybe it's not so new. Um, and what I would like to ask you is if you could explain to us um, in how far it is a new concept for trade policy, what, what changed? And also um, what, what, uh, what effect this has in our relationship um, to other big powers in this overall whole geoeconomic game we are currently facing. 
Thank you very much, uh, Stormy, for the introduction, for having looked up the component terms of open strategic autonomy. Listening to you, I thought, yeah, that's exactly what we were striving to achieve with uh, uh, this concept, uh, which is a mindset, I would say, uh, underpinning uh, our, our trade policy. So why did we do this? Well, obviously against the, the backdrop of a changed international environment, uh, what we have seen in the last years, since we came with our last strategy, which was 2015, the world has changed quite a bit. We have seen uh, a rise of geopolitical tensions, uh, notably between uh, the US and China. We have seen uh, 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 an increasing uh, weaponization of trade in what is a battle for technological, economic, and finally political supremacy. And we have to position ourselves against that backdrop, seeing also that uh, we live in a world where the multilateral system has been weakened and where more and more players uh, have recourse to unilateral actions. Um, these trends have been there already before, but they have been exacerbated, reinforced by the pandemic. So we thought, what do we do with trade policy? That's the external environment. Internally, we see that there, or we have seen that there is an enormous amount uh, of uh, 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 expectations and very different and sometimes contradictory expectations what trade policy can and should achieve. I mean, classically, it's to open markets, to create opportunities, to create growth and to create jobs, given that jobs in traded sectors also tend to be more, well, uh, better paying. Uh, I think that is an important element as well. Um, but then there's also the expectation with the climate emergency that trade does its part uh, to support the Green Deal, but also the digital transformation of the society. Um, we are also asked from trade policy to basically help implement international environmental commitments, uh, especially where the actual environmental agreements sometimes tend to be uh, rather weak on implementation, like the Paris Agreement. Um, at the same time, there is the wish to use trade policy for geopolitical purposes. Um, and it is one of the ways and perhaps the way in which the EU engages with the rest of the world. So, um, and then there's the expectation that through trade policy, we effect sometimes very far reaching change in third countries, for instance, in the way they organize their labor organization, uh, their labor relations, etc. So a whole host of sometimes contradictory expectations, and we have to navigate a course and try to find a new consensus in Europe that allows us uh, to move forward with trade policy and address these societal expectations in a realistic manner. And we think that open strategic autonomy is a mindset that helps doing that. In a way, the openness part goes almost without saying, unless we were to say that in the future, Europe wants to become self-sufficient, the EU will only produce what it consumes, not more than that. Well, I think we have to be open to the world. And not just, of course, for trade policy matters, but I think this, this is obvious. But what is new in the way we now look at openness is to say, openness means rules-based trade. And what we see is an increasing calling into question of WTO rules, and we need to shore up that multilateral trading system. Hence, this, the openness element also implies a pivot to multilateralism, compared to a trade strategy which was very largely focused on bilateral trade agreements. So I think, so there's a twist to the openness, but the openness as such has already been characterizing trade policy, of course, for the last uh, more than 40 years. Then uh, we have uh, the issue of strategic autonomy. And that is, of course, a term which is not, first of all, an economic policy or a trade policy term. It comes from defense, military planning, Nathalie knows that much better than I do, uh, Claudia as well, so I'm sure we will come to that origin. Um, and there have been concerns that when you transfer this, yeah, you create notions of self-sufficiency and autarky and an EU becoming inward looking. And that is why we insisted on having the open in front of strategic autonomy. But strategic autonomy in the sense that the EU has to be able to chart its own course in international affairs not to have to choose a lane, but uh, to be able to engage with all powers um, on the basis of a clear understanding of what are our long-term strategic interests and values and what are the means we have 
uh, to 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 uh, implement them. I think that is exactly uh, the thinking that that we have uh, uh, behind this. And then there is a new element in this strategic autonomy part. So uh, the twist in openness is towards the multilateral. And then there is also a pivot towards more assertiveness. Um, not that we haven't been non-assertive before, but I think we own that assertiveness now deliberately. And we are saying, well, any agreement is only as good at its implement as its implementation. And we have to be able to stand up for our own uh, uh, interests. And that is why when if I have to give a less elaborate and less learned definition of open strategic autonomy, the way I usually try to sum it up is to say open strategic autonomy is acting with others wherever you can, acting on your own wherever you must. And I think that is what we have there. And here on the assertiveness side, there are new instruments which we have developed and are continuing to develop in our toolbox. We have created the function of a chief trade enforcement officer. We are uh, uh, putting more emphasis on enforcing what we have negotiated and we are strengthening our unilateral toolbox uh, we will come with a new uh, uh, instrument uh, uh, in order to combat coercive behavior by other uh, countries. Um, we have already strengthened our rulebook in a number of, of, of areas, uh, and I hope we will continue uh, to do that. So I think that is the idea uh, behind open strategic autonomy, and I think it signals an update of trade policy, less than a radical shift, an update in the light of the changed international environment. So there are elements of continuity like the openness, but there are other elements which are new in this and they, they are on the sustainability side and on the assertiveness side. And I'm looking forward to being able to de develop these ideas in discussions uh, with others. Thank you, Stormy. Thank you so much. Um... I, I already found the treatable quote, um, acting with others um, as much as we can and whenever we can, um, but acting alone um, if that is necessary. And Tuma, I wanted to ask you um, how, how this, from your point of view, goes together with um, another central aspect, um, which Sabina just highlighted, multilateralism, and how that resonates in France. Um, and if you um, see the same interpretations of openness, strategic, strategic and autonomy in, in France, or if there is a slight twist to it, or maybe not. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you on, on this panel. Um, so I, I think that the first thing I want to say is, uh, just like uh, Sabina said earlier, uh, I think it's important to emphasize that this uh, open strategic autonomy initiative is not something that the EU invented just by its own. It's a reaction to global trends. Okay, so it comes in the so the context is relatively important. For my part, I think the the context are, has uh, really like three elements uh, to it, uh, going from the broadest to the, uh, the the narrowest. The broadest, of course, I think is uh, on the one hand. Uh, the first one would be the rising tension between the US and China. And uh, of course, we knew it would continue under the Biden administration. Um, in fact, th there were two things that were, uh, by, the Biden administration has been surprising in some respect, but there were two things that were absolutely easy to forecast. The first one, they would join, they would rejoin Paris. The second one, they would stay tough on China. I think everything else, you could argue, uh, maybe it's surprising what they do, but for these two parts, uh, I was 100% sure last summer that these two would sell through. Um, and so the, the, the rising tension with China is totally bipartisan in, in Washington. And uh, therefore it's, it's, a, it's a backdrop that will stay. Um, but that means is that big actors uh, think of themselves more and more strategically and uh, using all the tools at their disposal, including uh, trade policy. The, the second backdrop, I think, is uh, a sense of crisis in many uh, democracies, uh, that maybe the democracies are weaker than we thought. Maybe, after all, the Chinese model is not that bad. I mean, I think it's, you can perceive it in Europe uh, with some of the social uh, protests that we've seen in Europe. But you can perceive it uh, if you um, only give talks to other nations, uh, you know, like uh, 
uh, it's not so obvious anymore when you uh, see middle income or uh, you know just slightly in the below the median uh, income countries in the world they don't necessarily think that the chinese model is that bad because they see the growth they see the efficiency and they are not convinced that democracies are that great so both internally and globally there is a sense that democracies have uh, are somewhat in crisis um, and the third element of backdrop which is critical is that um, to some extent um, trade policy of the past is complete like tariffs for all practical purposes are gone so uh, you know pushing more uh, trade reforms to uh, ease the flow of uh, intermediate goods typically machines that are that's the bulk of trade or, um, or, or relatively cheap manufacturing goods that's done already so that means that trade has to evolve to tackle the changes uh, the changes ahead of us which are going to be first of course uh, the green transition obviously health as we saw and then uh, the issue of norm and and um, yeah norm and um, agreements on behavior when it comes to the digital market and to uh, labor rights so these are not the traditional you know tools that the w w used in the past and um, but I think if we want to, if the WTO uh, is going to, is to regain some, um, some meaning, some sense of purpose, then they will have to tackle these issues as well, or even perhaps more than as well, just like uh, full on. So I think that's the backdrop. So in this world, the EU has to ask itself, okay, what is it that we can do? What do we do well? What's our comparative advantage? And how do we do it? And um, I think it's very clear to me that the, the the one comparative, global comparative advantage of the EU is precisely the fact that it's rule-based, open, and multilateral. And in fact, if you look at surveys around the world of trust in institutions, it is amazing how high the EU ranks around the world. Pretty much every country on Earth puts the EU at the very top, usually ahead of the US and way ahead of, of China, of course. So people in um, other countries view the EU as a, more than a useful experiment. They think it's a useful benchmark. Uh, and why? Well, because we have 20, you know, seven, 28, depending on which day of the, of the week. But, um, you know, we have all these countries, they all first need to agree together. So what they come up with as rules typically has a really good flavor for a global agreement. So it's not by chance that take the GDPR, uh, pretty much every country in the world thinking of data protection today, they first look at the EU to, to, to get inspiration for what they should be doing uh, at home. So that's pretty striking. So what that means to me is that the EU first and foremost advantage is in uh, making rules that are fair, perceived as fair and mature at all. Um, and then I think the, uh, the added value of uh, the strategic autonomy part is to recognize the fact that uh, in the context of the global tension, that's not quite enough. Or even if you want to rephrase it, I think, even if your ultimate goal is still fully multilateral, the way to get there might be to be a bit more assertive. See what I mean? So that's why I think it's, it's more like a change in the, in the tools to get there. I don't think the goal of the U.S. has changed in that. I think we just recognize that sometimes, uh, even to achieve the same goal, it takes to be, uh, in, the, in today's world, you have to be slightly more assertive and definitely push more on the enforcement. So I think to me, that's the backdrop. Um, but I, I think for, for the EU, it's a, it's a very natural development. And um, I, I'm, I think I'm pretty confident that uh, it's going to work. Now, if you, of course, if you discuss the same thing in Berlin or in Paris, you're going to find that the, in Paris, you're going to hear more the strategic autonomy part and in Berlin, a bit more the openness part as expected. But I think that's, that's part of the course. Um, and I think it's, by the way, I think it's good. You see, that's precisely the point, which is the fact that the, in the EU, for anything to happen first, Germany and France need to agree on something. That, just that simple fact made, makes whatever agreement more appealing to other nations. See what I mean? Because that's like this, that's the, the, the heart of the EU. And this is, uh, Thomas, thank you so much. Um, the perfect lead over um, to the question I'm going to ask Claudia. Um, just um, a little technical question in between. Um, did you also hear that um, strange metallic sound in the background? Yes. Um, so I don't know what it is, uh, Toma, uh, Thomas. It sounds a little Instruction bit. Work. <laughs> Pardon? Construction outside. Construction work. And there I was thinking that one of your kids was banging on a pot saying, Dad, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> New York, New York is a very noisy town. <laughs> it's a busy town. And we didn't have, I mean, I at least didn't have any problems understanding you. Um, I hope 
that was okay for everybody. It was very rhythmic, I have to say, almost like a little beat um, in your presentation. <laughs> um, so Claudia, Thomas said that um, in France, there might be a little bit emphasis on the strategic, in Germany, maybe a little bit emphasis on the openness. Is that actually true? Or did you see any changes during the COVID um, pandemic in, in our perception and view on open strategic autonomy? Thank you, Stormy. Um, I, I'm happy to talk about uh, Germany and the shift in position the way I see it. I'm not sure if I should talk about US and China as well, or maybe just focus on Germany right now. Um, okay, so I, I, th I start with Germany. Um, I think everybody believes we are in there for a lot of openness, but I think this has changed. And I think there are two events which have actually changed the German position on European trade policy. And I think both were mentioned already. The first one, the first event that shaped German position uh, relates to the new geoeconomic environment that Zabina also mentioned. We have major players that are important for Germany, like the United States and China, which increasingly used their market as a leverage to push for their strategic interest. And this means that global trade relations, which were formerly governed by the WTO were now characterized by the increasing use of tariffs, by regulatory barriers and investment restrictions, which put fair competition to the test. The second event um, which definitely shaped German position was the Corona crisis, which led to an economic collapse of unprecedented scope. This year, I looked at the IMF World Economic Outlook and growth is expected to pick up again. According to the IMF, German GDP will grow by 3.6%. But in comparison, if you look at the United States and China, the US will grow by 6.4%, while China will have a growth rate of 84 And this means that Germany and also the Eurozone will emerge from the crisis comparatively worse off than, let's say, the United States and China. And I think this combination of a new geoeconomic environment and the impact, the economic impact of, of the crisis, which has hit Germany severely, has made Germany more cautious in trade and investment. And this means, from my perspective, that the new trade strategy of an open strategic autonomy, which combines the openness that was part of the previous trade strategy with resilience and assertiveness, has hit a nerve in Germany. I think that the focus in Germany has shifted from openness, which is still important because a large part of our economy depends on trade, but the focus has shifted to resilience and to the enforcement of fair international competition. And this means that the German government increasingly emphasized the need to fight unfair trade practices and subsidies by foreign countries. And the German government also emphasizes the need to regularly update the trade policy instrument of the EU and also at the level of the WTO. Germany also supports the use of anti-dumping measures and the new investment screening mechanism that was introduced at the EU level to protect European companies from unfair competition. And um, in addition, Germany has also tightened its own investment screening system. So the legal basis for FDI screening in Germany is the Foreign Trade and Payments Act from 2013 and the Foreign Trade and Payments Ordinance. There have been several adaptations, um, one in 2020 as a result to the EU investment screening regulation, but the latest revision is actually from May 2021, uh, where Germany further tightened the notification requirements and expanded the list of sensitive sectors. So I believe um, that Germany really values openness and, and values rules-based trade at the EU level with bilateral and ambitious free trade agreements and also at the WTO level. But I think the focus that we have right now is much more on resilience um, and assertiveness than we have before. Thanks. Thank you so much for making that so clear. And just to, to ask you a follow-up question, uh, what has that to do with China? I always love to talk about the EU and US because it's such a good partnership and we want to enhance that, but I'm also happy to talk about China because um, 
the the aspects that relate to to resilience and assertiveness have a strong impact on the relationship that the EU has with China. So the EU aims to achieve fair and rules based cooperation and to become more assertive in trade. And this means, and this is what Sabine mentioned, the EU is undergoing a reform of its unilateral trade toolbox, adapting to the trade distorting measures of all countries, but particularly from China. And so this relates to investment screening to a toolbox for 5G telecoms for an instrument on foreign subsidies. I think uh, it will be released this Wednesday. But remember correctly, we have the international procurement instrument. So there's uh, a lot of reform and overhaul or also of new European instrument. And I think uh, Germany supports this development very much so. Um, the EU also negotiated CHI, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. And I think that's also a way to address structural concerns that we have with China. And I think together with the new Chief Trade Enforcement Officer, this means that all these measures enhance EU assertiveness vis-a-vis -vis China. And, and lastly, the European strategy of an open strategic autonomy, as Sabina said, focuses on the WTO and the multilateral level. And I think the EU will demand much more reform efforts by China to assume more responsibility and to curb the negative um, effects of China on global trade, particularly through its subsidies. And I think all these developments are very much supported by the German government. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia. We um, now heard that there is a bouquet of different policy goals and policy instruments, and it's really ambitious. Um, Natalie, um, do you think this is going to uh, succeed? Um, and what would be the preconditions um, for success? Mm. Well, thank you, Stormy. Um, and, and, and let me indeed sort of perhaps also connect some of the dots over, over the course of uh, this conversation. I mean, I think it's sort of, um, I mean, my starting point is that of saying, well, you know, the agenda of strategic autonomy, and then I'll come to the open, uh, is the agenda, uh, it's a generational agenda. And it's a generational agenda which goes well beyond uh, trade. In fact, as was uh, being uh, hinted at earlier by, by, by Sabine, it started off as, as an agenda from the realm of security and defense. Uh, and then it has been extended to all sorts of different policy areas from trade to investment, to digital, to climate, to energy. We can talk about it in terms of migration. I mean, we can literally map this on each and every policy area. Uh, and it is a generational agenda. Now, why has it become an agenda today? I mean, it taken at a very basic level, uh, one could say, well, surely this should have been the agenda all along. Um, if we look at what autonomy means, which is at the end of the day, simply the ability to live by your laws. I mean, you know, this is what uh, our classical Greek studies uh, teach us. So if it's so basic, why now? Well, the answer is, is what was being said earlier by, by several of, uh, 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 of the speakers, i.e. that it is only now, and by now I mean over the last years, that it's becoming increasingly clear that there are a number of actors that want to impinge uh, upon our norms and rules and, uh, and laws uh, and practices, that we no longer live in a relatively benign so-called international liberal order uh, in which it was more a question about us promoting our own norms and rules and values uh, rather than trying to protect ourselves uh, against others trying to impinge, impinge upon them. So the reason why we're having this conversation now is because of a profoundly changed international context. Uh, and, and given that we're talking about big structural changes, I think we can only measure the success of this particular agenda, not by taking a snapshot of today or tomorrow or in one month or even one year's time, but really looking at it, as I said, as a generational challenge. Now, you know, does this mean that it is uh, unambiguous or it doesn't have its critical aspects or its criticisms? Mm -hmm. I think, yes, it does. I mean, it, it does have, you know, sort of critiques that can be made. Uh, and in fact, I think that embedded, and here I come to the open, uh, embedded in the term open strategic autonomy is precisely the recognition that there are some criticisms that can be made, you know, that there are some, some, some 
critical elements in this agenda, which do not mean that the agenda should not be pursued, but it does mean that it should be pursued with eyes wide open to what those critical elements are. And, and to me, you know, there are sort of uh, sort of straw man criticisms and real criticisms uh, to, to, be, to be raised on when it comes to strategic autonomy. To me, the sort of straw man uh, criticism is, is what normally is applied not so much in the trade uh, dimension, but when we're talking about it in terms of defense, uh, of basically saying, well, if we want to pursue strategic autonomy in the uh, area of defense, this means loosening relations with the United States and NATO and blah, blah, blah. blah. This is normally the, the, the criticism that is made. To me, it's a straw man criticism for the simple reason that it's just so way off out there in terms of how realistic it is that it's um, it, it's not it's, it's not real. I mean, it's not real. You know, the point is if we simply make a few first steps in the direction of taking upon ourselves greater responsibility and greater risk in security and defense aspects. Um, we would be so far away from actually achieving autonomy that this is obviously not something that is going to hamper in any shape or form uh, the strength of the, of the transatlantic relationship. Where I do think that there are some valid criticisms, which as I said, do not in my mind mean that therefore this is not an agenda to be pursued, but it, it's an agenda to be pursued with eyes wide open to these criticisms is, and here we come to the open, is the fact that Indeed, if one does pursue uh, sort of blindfolded to criticisms, uh, the uh, agenda of autonomy, one does and one could run the risk of protectionism, external protectionism, as well as I would say, and this is an aspect which perhaps has not been underlined so much, internally uh, reinforcing existing imbalances within the union. Mm -hmm. To put very clearly, if we kind of transpose this conversation onto the whole debate over European champions, for instance, uh, uh, it is obvious that it is easier to pursue and to strengthen European champions uh, if we strengthen the strong within the union. Uh, and the point is, of course, by strengthening, strengthening the strong within the union, one exacerbates existing economic divergences within the union. So I think there is a risk of imbalances within the union. I think there is a risk of protectionism externally. Does that mean, therefore, we should chuck the autonomy agenda? No, it doesn't. It means that we'd have to navigate it uh, or with, you know, trying to sort of avoid these potential pitfalls. Uh, and, and that there are ways of doing it. You know, I think, for instance, a virtuous uh, model, if you like, to be pursued is the model that we're pursuing when we're talking, for instance, about batteries or about hydrogen of alliances. So, you know, thinking rather than I'm going to put it in a very black and white way. You know, if one thinks, again, just to take the example of, of European champions, huh? uh, one can take the sort of Alston Siemens hmm, approach to European champions, hmm, which in my view would be a way of potentially, yes, pursue, you know, promoting a European champion, but in a way which strengthens imbalances, if you like, within the union, or the alliance model of European champions, huh, which is, yes, strengthening a European something, uh, but in a slightly more if you like, heterogeneous manner, if you like. And there are two different models to pursue the same aim. So, you know, I think, you know, I, I just raised this example to say there, you know, that there are ways of doing it. It is probably going to be more complicated, more complex, huh? uh, but at the end of the day, if we want to navigate this, it's the only way to do it. Thank you so much, um, Natalie. And just to let our audience know, um, we already have the first two questions um, and I'm going to pick that up um, after we also hear from Elma. Um, Natalie has to leave us um, at, uh, for Sharp. Um, so any questions to her, um, please um, write them down in the Q&A function um, already. That would be wonderful. Emma, I saw you nodding a couple of times, um, but uh, also shaking your heads a couple of times. Um, and how does it resonate what you, uh, what you have heard so far? And um, from your long time as a European parliamentarian, um, it also would be interesting to hear what you hear from your colleagues in the uh, European Parliament, how all of this is resonating there. Uh, 
Um, we can't hear you yet. Um, Emma, you need to unmute yourself. I'm, I'm always nodding and so on because I'm a very emotional man. Uh, that it uh, has an advantage, but also disadvantages in practical life. <laughs> uh, I think I mean, most of what uh, I can agree, uh, but uh, perhaps I want uh, to make a few points stronger. Sabina said in the beginning, probably meaning it a little bit negative, weaponizing uh, trade instruments. But that is the fact what we have. The Americans, the Russians, and the Chinese use trade also for foreign and security instrument. We have to be aware of that and have to deal with that. And uh, if we forget it and believe that we do not have only open trade, uh, then I think uh, we lose that competition. We have to take that into account. Our autonomy, autonomy nobody in this world has nowadays in this global order, full autonomy. Everyone needs something from everybody. And, uh, and, uh, and for us Europeans to have autonomy, total autonomy would be stupid because we need a lot of products, raw materials from others, and we have to export. Germany is the best example for that. And therefore, is uh, such a misunderstanding. Strategic autonomy means uh, to close up outer key protectionism, protectionism and would be the total wrong way. But we have to have influence in order to be successful in following our interests. And uh, this is only possible if we combine the strengths of the internal market do it on the European-wide strategy, and also be faster in developing the digital internal market where we're not good enough yet. But because that is the power basis that others, that we can influence others, but also that we influence others because our market is so interesting for others that they have to export us. And these are the instruments to organize the rule-based multilateralism which is always the best thing. But that can we only do together. And I think we, at the end of the day, we have to do it with the United States together. And here at the moment, I'm not so uh, uh, optimistic as I was directly after Biden's victory. Uh, someone said Biden is a Trump with good manners. Uh, that goes perhaps too far, but uh, at the moment to set up a joint policy to common standards, that is the right approach to China. That the Europeans and Americans set up together standards. And uh, here, uh, I think we have to increase that when that might be possibly uh, politically possible. What we have to do is strengthen our own strengths, internal market, rule-based multilateralism, but strengthen all our own strengths with bilateral agreements, free trade agreements. If you look into the figures, the European Union has the biggest increase in trade with countries where we have free trade agreements with. And therefore, these bilateral uh, treaties set, use it strategically, not only for trade, but also for trade. It's a thing of the utmost importance uh, for us uh, to do that. And here we come to a situation which is quite difficult. When we see the discussion in the European Parliament and in France and some other countries about the ratification of the Mercosur Treaty, that first of all, there are protectionist ideas behind it in agriculture. But I think here we overdo it, perhaps. We want this trade also influence other things, as it was mentioned before from our French professor from New York, that. <laughs> that uh, uh, in the social questions, in the question of climate, security, and so on. Here we have not to overdo it. When I see the standards European Parliament wants to set in this ratification, then we want to have the climate change policy of the European Union, the social policy of the European Union, the labor policy of the European Union the standards. And I think that goes sometimes too far. It has also sometimes a protectionist outlook. 
Have you not to go then perhaps we have to put it the Paris climate, climate agreement, ILO standard, but not what we do higher. Here to find the right balance in such a question that it's not protectionist, but it, it, it's a way to move forward in climate, social labor questions, health questions, and so on. That I think here to find the right level in that. And then I think there's a few strategic points uh, where we have to, um, uh, to get our own capacities in a better way. We have seen that in the health question, uh, when we see uh, what we have to do in the pharmaceutical sector, for example, that certain points we have also again in a certain way in our own uh, region. And that has also to do with the strategic question when it comes to uh, KI and other questions uh, where we have to stop uh, that uh, such uh, um, industries can be bought, for example, by China. So have a fair trade rule, but not a protectionist one but protect ourselves in such a few things without destroying the free trade. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Elmar. Um, and um, I don't know if you've already read the first question in our Q&A, because you uh, again made a great lead over to that question um, on um, technology and how to deal with technology. So the first question is by Florian Nehm, and he is asking, how um, dealing with digitalization and also regulating um, the big platforms and taxing the big platforms is going to be part um, of the uh, concept of open strategic autonomy um, and how that relates to our big partners, um, EU and China. And I would first like to, um, I was going to give the floor to Thomas <laughs> because I know that you are, um, a, uh, an expert um, on taxation issues. And um, I also would love to hear Sabine um, on this point of regulating digitalization. Tomar, do you want to go first and then uh, Sabine? Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I also wanted to, to react, but it's very connected to the question to what uh, Natalie and uh, Elmar said. Um, uh, to point something out, which is the risk of protectionism is there. Uh, but I think to me there's a greater risk, which is the risk of uh, watering down the very, the very, very successful EU antitrust policy of the past 20 years. And um, so let's take the uh, example of Alstom and Siemens. As, I mean, as you all know, I was a fierce critic of that deal. I was 100% behind uh, Margaita, and I'm glad she stood our ground and told Paris and Berlin to go pack their suitcases because they were, that was a stupid idea. But it was a stupid idea because it was very bad policy for within the EU. You would have created a monopoly that would have been marginally good for shareholders, perhaps in Germany and, and, and France, and terrible for everybody else. So of course she had to say no. Um, now, uh, and, um, but so he, the connection with protectionism here is the following, which is that um, the danger is that if the EU is not assertive enough on the trade side, then people will try to get a backdoor way of doing it by watering down the domestic antitrust. And that is, that first of all, that's a bad idea in terms of policy. It's also worse for, for everybody in the EU. See, if people say, well, if you're not able to get the Chinese to stop subsidizing uh, and closing their markets, then we would react by creating our own uh, so-called uh, domestic champion, which is code word for just like, you know, letting them be fat monopolies and then charge high prices to everybody in the EU. Um, that would be a very bad outcome. Okay, so, so that's why I think that the danger there, you have to be quite careful because it could be the case that by being more assertive on the trade side, the EU could also more be, be more pro-free market at home. Okay, so I think that's, it's important to recognize that, that trade-off uh, in, in that context. And I don't want to take too long, so I, I think Sabine can, I, I won't say anything about the digital market. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US on, on competition, I think that you know, that's one place where it's moving in the US, moving quite fast. Uh, it's moved from the first, the states started uh, being active because the previous, the Trump administration was very much inactive at the federal level. So the impulse uh, to regulate Facebook, Amazon, uh, Google, and even Apple actually. Um, came from like state uh, attorney generals, but now that the uh, federal administration is also in that mode, 
uh, with very strong domination at the uh, FTC and people who are very much pro uh, tough antitrust, I think that we would have both the state level and the federal level pushing towards stronger antitrust enforcement in the US, which then is going to make cooperation with the EU that much easier. Uh, let me just stop here. I don't want to be too long. And Sabine, um, yeah. maybe you can also tell us a little bit about the anti-subsidy um, instrument. Yes, but let me try and pick up something that Claudia said uh, to put this into, into uh, context and which also links in with Thomas' uh, uh, remarks just now. I really think that um, resilience is a very good term to capture what we are trying to achieve. And the resilience obviously depends on the strength of our internal market. And that in turn depends on the quality of the regulation we do. Um, Thomas mentioned in the beginning GDPR, which is setting a gold standard, but we are only able to set that gold standard through EU regulation by having convincing quality of our regulation, uh, which resonates with what societies are trying to achieve through such uh, um, um, regulation. Um, and here, sometimes I have the impression that we are putting the Brussels effect on steroids by saying, well, we are regulating for a market of half a billion people. We can just project that to the outside. And there is an element of hubris there. And that is also, I think, what Elma was uh, driving at when we say through our agreements, we are basically uh, uh, telling the rest of the world, do like we do, and it will be good for you. I think there has to be a little bit more uh, humility also on the EU side. We should not be shy about the strength of our internal market. But the strength of our internal market, in addition to the quality of the regulation we have, also depends on having open competition inside that single market. We will not be able to enhance our competitiveness by restricting competition, not in the single market, not internationally. What we need to look at when we look at resilience is how does the, our integration in global supply chains work? And how can we make sure that we do not have through the workings of comparative advantage, et cetera, but also through state-led interventions in the economy, a system where we become vulnerable because certain uh, uh, strategic products are sourced from what, just one or two sources and how do we deal with that. But in general, we have seen in the pandemic that integration into global supply chains is an absolute strength and that is what we need to preserve. Now, we are also looking at strategic vulnerabilities, but that doesn't mean, again, that if you say, oh, a sector is strategic, that doesn't mean that you have to reshore it to the EU. And I've seen interesting studies, um, you know, on the semiconductors, everyone very much now alert to the risks to global production in semiconductors, but it is just not, uh, it cannot be financed, it just makes no sense for every region to strive for autonomy in supply of semiconductors, because that is a global industry which is organized, which is very intense in, in R&D spending, very capital intensive, so what you need to look at is, are there certain issues where I have to look for more diversification? It's been the same on the medical products, on the vaccine story. Um, of, on vaccines, more than on semiconductors, you could say, let's bring everything back to Europe. But what does that mean in terms of the costs for supplying the world with the necessary drugs? And what does it mean uh, in terms of the cost for public health systems? So I really think the resilience uh, uh, lens is a very good one to look at this, and it gets us away from this wrong interpretation of strategic autonomy or open strategic autonomy uh, as something looking for, for uh, autarky. And I fully agree, as I said, it depends on the quality of regulation and the openness of the, of the internal market. And I'm very glad to hear that in, on this panel, we all seem to have the same reading of the uh, uh, Alstom uh, uh, Siemens issue. Now, in terms of um, uh, um, what, what are we trying to, to achieve here is to the extent that we police that the internal market is as free as possible from distortions uh, 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 through state aid, etc. we obviously cannot allow that then foreign actors 
come here, come on a shopping spree, uh, 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 apply, uh, participate in government tenders, uh, etc., supported by subsidies uh, from foreign actors. So basically, what we are trying to do with this legislation that is coming out this week, as, as you said, Stormy, uh, is exactly to complement uh, and, and make sure that we have the same disciplines as we have internally, also for external actors. Um, and this is not targeted at any country. Yeah, uh, This is something which applies the, across the board. And the Commission will have the possibility to uh, uh, take action on its own. Uh, but we are also working very closely with the member states because we need to ensure that there is throughout the internal market the same approach so that we do not you know create imbalances inside the internal market which will then make it extremely uh, difficult for us uh, uh, to to uh, uh, to maintain the openness we have in the internal market but also towards the outside uh, towards the outside world um, so another key word that we haven't used yet but which is very much behind a lot of the remarks I heard is this uh, strengthened focus on a level playing field. And the challenge will be how do we reconcile the creation of a level playing field uh, through some basic rules that we need to have to avoid the distortions we have seen, notably through non market economies intervention uh, uh, in, in the economy and how that affects other uh, jurisdictions. How can we, um, uh, um, how can we um, combine, um, how can we combine uh, um, um, this uh, basic setting of rules with the preservation and the development of our comparative advantage as EU? So we also need to, and that is why trade policy is not just trade policy. Trade policy has to be the external projection of all internal policies because that is the only way that we can preserve and build our competitiveness in, in, uh, in today's world. And that means an increased focus now on digital, which we are pursuing autonomously through the quality of regulation in an open manner uh, of the EU market, working bilaterally with countries like Japan, Singapore, etc., who are like-minded in this, but then also multilaterally by trying to negotiate rules in the WTO. And I think that is a good demonstration of the connection between the single market and trade policy. Thank you so much uh, for shedding shedding a lot more light into the uh, into the issue and um, adding with preciseness and concreteness. And I would hand, like to hand over to Natalie um, once more. Um, and maybe you can, um, in your fin final words, because I know that you need <laughs> need to go, need to go. And I also already saw you making eye contact. Um, with somebody in your room. Um, maybe you could also say a few words on um, technology um, and subsidies. Yeah, I mean, uh, a couple of points that I wanted to, to make. make. Um, I mean, on the question of, of, of technology and, and standards, um, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, you know, the sort of hubris point that, that Sabine and, and Elmar was making, I think is, is of fundamental importance. You know, I, I think that um, you know, yes, we have managed to shape uh, global rules, uh, including on issues pertaining to technology, uh, because we're good at shaping rules, but also because we're a large market. Now, uh, that's all very well and good, but in relative terms, that market is shrinking, we know demographically. Uh, and so, in all honesty, we will only be able to continue shaping those rules um, if we manage to sort of strengthen ourselves, not simply on, on how much we weigh on the demand side of the equation, but how strong we are on the supply side uh, of the equation, which means really, you know, working uh, working on the digital union, working on innovation, working on retaining technologies in Europe once they start being developed, uh, if you like, in Europe, uh, because we cannot simply pat ourselves on the back forever saying we're good at shaping global standards. It will not remain that way, you know, as good as we, we may be. The second point that, and, and final point that I wanted to raise is this question, you know, sort of relates to this question of supply chains and diversification. And and I think that, again, you know, sort of cognizant of the fact that um, we will be struggling between 
essentially, you know, how much more of a cost, economic cost, are we willing to pay in order to get more security, uh, including security of supply, basically. Uh, I think the way to square, and, and it is, uh, you know, it is a choice to be made, you know, and the balance will weigh more on one side and more on the other, depending on our uh, judgment, if you like, of the security imperative at hand. But I think that in making that choice, we need to be thinking about geography uh, as, as obviously something that not, does not stop with the European Union. You know, I think that in a word of greater uh, diversification, in order to strengthen the security of supply of critical uh, products, we have to be thinking far more in terms of investing in particularly neighboring regions. And by neighboring regions, I do not only mean, you know, the Western Balkans and Turkey. I think I see neighboring regions are stretching, you know, east to Central Asia and down to Central Africa. And that's the geographic space I think that we have to keep in mind as we make that choice of, yes, higher costs inevitably, huh? But they cannot be too high, basically. Otherwise, you know, sort of our citizens will simply not want to pay them. Uh, and, and, and extending that geography, basically, is, is the only way, I think, to square that circle. Thank you very, very much. Um, and also for being here today. Um, Sorry, and apologies, I've got to, I've got to rush off. Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. Unpleasant things, unfortunately. <laughs> well, good luck. Very, very Thank quickly. you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. So, so the next question is, and I was just waiting for it, um, on the EU-China investment agreement um, and on its merits. Um, and um, I would first like to hand this question to Claudia and Elma um, before we then uh, go to Sabine. But, but Thomas, um, if you want to say something on the investment agreement, please also chip in. But um, first. Claudia, because I know that you have published and written on the topic, and then Elma, I think I know that you also have a distinct opinion um, on that agreement. Yes, thank you. Um, I published on, on the CHI um, together with Storby, so I'm very happy uh, to have her as a competent co-author for this article. No, I think uh, CHI was, it is a necessary agreement. I mean, if you look at the at the three sections, it's market access, it's structural, um, structural problems in the Chinese market. And the third one is sustainability and, and labor part. And there were a lot of criticism uh, directed at Kai. Um, I think when you look at the market access uh, part, a lot of uh, criticism was directed that you don't really have new market access, but uh, it's more like you, you wrote down the market access that was already there. Um, I think that's, not really a valid point. I think we need the agreement to have new rules with China. I think even though there might not be very much new market access, it's still something that enhances predictability for European companies um, and that makes it worthwhile. When you look at the structural aspects, I think um, it's also worthwhile. It um, talks about subsidies, about level playing field. Um, it talks about uh, forced technology transfer. It's also sometimes or even on an MFN basis, so not only related to the EU. I think it, it was very important that you address these concerns, that um, the EU tried to put um, um, the relationship in trade and investment with China on a rules-based basis. Um, so I think it's a first step. I don't think it goes far enough. I think it was important. I think it's a first step. And the point is, I mean, it needs to be ratified, which is difficult enough. But once we have the ratification, it's important that, that China implements the agreement. And what we've seen at the WTO is that implementation might be um, a big problem. I have one point where I know that Sabine disagrees. Um, I think we should have waited for the Biden administration. I think it would have been a very good point for the EU um, to talk um, with uh, Sullivan or the Biden, incoming Biden administration to make a point um, that these concerns that the EU has is something that the US shares. We have the trilateral initiative um, where a lot of these issues were put on the ground. You can say they have the phase one agreement, which is true, they didn't asked the um, EU when they negotiated the phase one agreement, but I think for the incoming Biden administration, it would have been nice to wait to sort of show China that there's a lot of transatlantic cooperation going on with CHI. So in the basis, I think CHI is important. It was necessary that we negotiated it, but um, we might have waited. And I know that Sabina disagrees. But first, first, Emma, before 
I hand it back to Sabine. Emma, you need to unmute yourself again. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't. We still can't hear you. Yeah, you Perfect. can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. I have always a problem with my dog. I have to look after the day that mm -hmm. he makes certain noises. <laughs> and uh, uh, I agree what uh, Claudia said uh, at the end. Uh, the greatest philosopher of all time, American philosopher of all time, Frank Sinatra once has said, timing is everything. And uh, here I think uh, uh, it looked a little bit at the end of the German presidency that it was rushed up uh, and uh, it had certain bad feelings in certain uh, quarters and uh, that made me a little bit nervous. And there's also the formulation about uh, human rights in that, uh, that I do not mean yet now as a contradiction of that, what I've said in my first part, but uh, when we look, use that formulation, uh, that might be not uh, uh, encouraging to have it in other treaties, where perhaps it would be otherwise easier to put it in. Uh, but uh, this, uh, when I see how difficult it is with the United States, that is my main concern. But to have any agreement, which um, puts the Chinese into rules and have then the, the, the courage, the courage that to look into the case that they fulfill the agreement. The second part is in that point, the most important one. And here I hope also that Germany, but was not always uh, in the first round of that, Sabine will know it when I see, for example, the question, this is more the English word for the sun collectors and so on, that the Germans stopped uh, the anti-dumping policy in Brussels in order to have a good trip to Beijing. Uh, that uh, are questions where German trade policy weakened the common European position. Sabine. I'm wondering how it how come that I missed the part where you all shifted from assertiveness to oh we cannot sign a deal with China before having talked to the Americans. I want to see the American administration that would say let's first talk to Europe before we sign a deal with China. They didn't do that, um, and actually we had tried to coordinate with them because some of the issues we were discussing. Uh, where, uh, uh, where things we thought they would also discuss in their phase one deal, until then it turned out that the phase one deal uh, was a purely mercantilistic deal uh, for agricultural purchases. But um, so I really, this is a point I simply do not get. I can, to a certain, uh, uh, up to a certain point. But Bina, I fear you're right. Um, I can, I could, I could understand people making that argument on the 30th of December, but seriously, making that argument in April or May 2021, to me, makes no sense whatsoever, because this has not in any way dented the cooperation that, China, that the US wants to have with us on certain practices with China. But engaging with the US, which is what we want to do, we have to do on the basis of our own China strategy. We cannot, I mean, that was the starting point of this open strategic autonomy. We have to work with the US on the basis of our own China strategy. We cannot have our China strategy being uh, 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 tailored or defined by what the US wants from us. So, you know, there's, there's some disconnect here in the discussion, which I find a little bit surprising. Um, and uh, uh, this is a necessary treaty. Um, because it secures the autonomous uh, market opening that China has uh, undertaken since they joined the WTO, which is not negligible, but there is also true new market access there. It's the first time uh, that we, uh, that anyone anchored the rules we've been discussing in the trilateral on forced technology transfer, on state-owned enterprises, on subsidies in an agreement with China. And it is rare, but I also have to contradict uh, Elmar Brock because the language we have on the efforts to ratify ILO conventions is exactly what we have 
for instance, with Vietnam for what is an overall FTA. So a much further reaching agreement. We got the same type of commitment, but again, we have to recognize that ratification of ILO standards is an autonomous act, a sovereign act of a country. You can try to shape that, you encourage that. We have also made it clear that the credibility of this commitment will be evaluated in the run up to the ratification. We've always explained that to, uh, to China, but we have to recognize this is an autonomous act. And uh, if you, you don't have to take my word for it, talk to the ILO who is extremely pleased with what we have achieved with China because nobody else has done that before and it gives them a real opportunity uh, to work with China. Now, prospects for ratification, I'm not going to speculate on that since the uh, overreaction of China to the very measured uh, sanctions introduced under the global human rights sanctions regime. Uh, but it is very clear that as long as we have any members of the European Parliament, uh, think tanks, etc., on a sanctions list, I cannot see this uh, ratification moving forward. I hope that we, at some stage we will have conditions that would allow us to move forward because engaging China through bilateral rules is an essential element of our strategy, as is getting them to sign up to stronger rules in the WTO for a level playing field, and as are our autonomous instruments. And interestingly enough, I would argue that the conclusion of the negotiations on CHI have actually uh, accelerated work on autonomous instruments, uh, the, global, the use of the global human rights sanctions regime, uh, as well as uh, forthcoming legislation on due diligence, including on forced labor. Before I hand over to Tom, uh, Thomas, I, I um, need to ask one question from the audience, uh, Sabine, uh, going to you. And that is uh, the question, if resilience wouldn't be increased, if we reduced our economic dependence on countries like Russia and China, instead of integrating further with them, what would you say? Um, it's horses for courses. So, for instance, there are certain practices from China which we can only discipline through more rules in the WTO. And we have to use our autonomous instruments in order to convince China that it is in their interest to sign up. Just like we have to convince the US that it is better to deal with China through multilateral rules and an enforcement in the WTO than to try to do so unilaterally, uh, which they have tried in the, in the past four years and which hasn't worked too well. Now, uh, there are certain areas uh, where we will have to look at uh, things from a security perspective. There are certain, there's certain critical infrastructure where indeed we have to make sure that we are not dependent uh, on countries uh, that could exploit uh, uh, such dependence um, and uh, on countries which have totally different values from ours. And that is why we are applying the FDI screening uh, instrument. But I don't think that you can wholesale cut off countries. I mean, we can't push Russia or China off the planet. We share the same planet and we need to work with them to address global challenges. And that is why we need a mix of instruments. And in certain areas, yes, we have to say, well, we have to make sure that uh, on critical infrastructure, whether that is in telecoms or, or something else, we do not uh, uh, fall into a uh, strategic dependency uh, on one or the other partner. But by the way, you never know how uh, things turn out. And I think that's something we've also learned in the last four years. I think uh, being uh, strategically dependent on one or the other country is never a good idea, which is the reason why we need to have this diversification. But we also have to have a clearer security prism uh, uh, through which we look at things like uh, foreign investment and trade. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Thank you. Um, I think I, I, I probably agree with Sabina on, on this debate. I, I think I don't think the EU should have waited for any input from the US in making its move uh, to establish its autonomy. Uh, but also, I don't want to make two points to complement what what the discussion has been um, on the US-China. Um, so uh, the first thing is, of course, the. <clears throat> um, I think that one of the uh, virtue of the, the deal with the EU or between the EU and, and China is it 
it puts China in front of its own responsibilities and contradictions. Like, you know, uh, they, they have a choice. They don't, the way they treat Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the Uyghur region, it's a choice they have to make. And they have to understand the consequences if, if, uh, uh, of their choices. Uh, it, and I think it's also very important to realize that uh, there's a lot of disagreement within China. There are different factions. And so what we see from the outside, which might look like an overreaction, sometimes it's, it's the product of an internal struggle. Um, you, definitely in the case of the, uh, the, the sanction against the uh, think tank and parliamentary members of the EU, but even like if you look at the way they are treating the, uh, the, their big firms now, uh, it's, it's a struggle which is all about politics within China. Um, so I think that we should not think of China as one bloc. And that's important when we think of it, because the question is, who are we trying to influence? You know? And then the answer is, well, we are trying to influence the, the large fraction within China, which is maybe not the most vocal, but who understand that a deal is better than no deal. Mm -hmm. And on the US side, it's a little bit the same. Um, I think that um, there is, to me, the most important question in US foreign policy right now is the following. There seems to be a strong belief in Washington that the way to get China to do, uh, the way to influence China in the right direction is to decouple from China. That's, that's kind of a dominant narrative in Washington right now. And I don't have empirical evidence. I, don't, I mean, I think it's a question where reasonable people can disagree, but I don't think it's obvious at all that you will get more influence on China by decoupling from China. You could, you could make the opposite argument. Or at the very least, this has to be open for debate. And because it's not really open for debate in Washington, it has to be at the center of the EU strategy, which is why I fully agree with the fact that it's strategically, it's good for us to, and to try to push towards engaging China in a multilateral fashion. I think that's actually is the right course for the EU. Unfortunately, our time is already up. I would love to give it back to Claudia and to Elma, um, but I know that Sabina, uh, Sabine and many, many of you um, have follow-up uh, meetings already scheduled. Um, and I also have to say, um, I'm sorry to the audience that I didn't call on you directly. There were so many questions and uh, we were a little strapped for time. So I tried to integrate the questions into our discussion. Um, I want to end with one final round where you just give me one word as an answer and the question is going to be difficult. Um, so brace yourself. <laughs> if you had to decide for 2021, which trade project of the European Union you want to successfully succeed, I mean, you want to succeed this year, which of these trade projects would it be? And I'm starting with Claudia. WTO reform. <laughs> Emma. Mercosur. Thomas. Uh, WTO reform, just like Claudia. And Sabino? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> Sorry, I have to unmute myself. Yeah, all of them, of course. Um, but I think WTO reform will take us necessarily beyond 2021. Um, so I'm going to say something that uh, we are doing uh, internally, and that is a successful adoption of our anti-coercion instrument, which we will present at the end of the year. But I agree with everything that was said here. We have to do all of them. It's because everything is ASAP. You have to do everything AS ASAP as well. And we have full confidence uh, that the European Commission and you are going to march full speed ahead. Thank you so much um, for all of you um, being here today and for this marvelous and insightful um, discussion. We will continue this discussion um, because this is the first in a row of events on strategic autonomy, um, open strategic autonomy. And next time we will look at digitalization. Then we also want to look at climate and energy policy, um, security, and um, last uh, but not least, we want to bind it all together in a big um, digital event in the end, or maybe even a physical, if the corona crisis um, allows. Thank you so much again also to our participants uh, to sending in so many really, really great questions. And uh, with this, this concludes our event. And um,
Thank you so much. Keep safe, keep healthy, and see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye